So 25 years ago, I read Peter Singer and became a vegetarian because I couldn't bear what I'd read about how pigs are kept in sheds. Five years ago, I heard Joel Salatin speak at the Lake House. If you don't know Joel Salatin, I'm just going to say go and read some of his books, especially Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. And, um, and You Can Farm. Read You Can Farm first, uh, if you don't already know his work. So I, we heard him speak at the Lake House in Dalesford five years ago when we were still in the suburbs of Melbourne in Fairfield with a very farm-like backyard. And we went from yearning to live in the country and grow more, more of our own food to we're going to be pig farmers actually in that session. So it's a fairly radical decision <laughs> to make, sitting in the lake house especially. Um, <laughs> but, but it was obvious to us that having wanted to live in the country, the thing to do in the country, of course, is grow food. And to grow it commercially to make a living so that actually all you're doing is growing food. That's what you do. And Joel made it sound possible. It was the first person it had. So everyone else said, well, you can't make a living as a farmer. You know, oh, it'll be great growing all your own food. That'll be lovely. You guys are really good at that, and that'll be fun for you. But you're never going to make a living growing food. Joel counted that wisdom, and he said, you can make a living making, growing ethical, sustainable food. Um, and here's how. And he gave us all that list that Joel does about supply chain control and direct sales and um, pigness of the pig. Of course, that's where he got me, pigness of the pig. I was like, I get that. Um, so a year later we found ourselves on our farm at Eganstown, eight kilometers from where we heard Joel speak at the lake house. And that's just over three and a half years ago now. And at the start, we had 69 acres of lush volcanic soils. We actually have the southern half of a volcano. Um, we have stewardship of a very beautiful little syndicon. And we, wanted to, we started with our pigs, with six pigs, just a boar and five gilts. And each day, you know, we'd go, oh, maybe we should go walk the perimeter because it's like a lovely day. I think we should walk the perimeter. Of course, now you only walk the perimeter to find the short in the electric. You don't do it because it's a lovely day. If it's a lovely day, you're probably butchering. So it's a very different life to what we started with. That first year was a kind of, kind of romantic homesteader year. Um, we did, we grew all of our own food. You know, we were growing this enormous uh, veggie garden because we could, we had this time. We had these beautiful pigs. There were six and then they all had litters, and there were 56. <laughs> right, now we better figure out what to do with 56 pigs. And I know a lot of people have done that with the pigs. Suddenly, there are a lot more of them. We also got cattle at the same time. We started out getting them just as um, lawn mowers because there was a lot of feed on the hill paddock. So I thought, oh, we'll get some cattle. We'll be able to just eat our own beef. Yeah, right, 12 cattle. We need to eat 12 cows in a year? I don't think so. So clearly that then became part of what would happen down, down the um, road, which is sell beef as well. So part of what you're going to keep hearing in this story is that there are a lot of accidents, happy, happy accidents. There's not, there wasn't always really good planning. There's a mixture of really good planning and total surprise to us that that was a really good idea. And I think you have to just run with that a little bit. Leaps of faith are part of this journey, right? So we get ready to, pro to process the first pigs. And everybody had said, Tammy, you're going to have trouble getting a butcher. It's really hard to find butchers when you're a smallholder. They're all retail business owners. They work six days a week. And for them to fit in your regular need for butchery, you're going to struggle. We're like, yeah, 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 we get it. The first time you speak to a butcher before you've ever had an animal butchered and you actually not that long ago were a vegetarian is not an easy thing to do. You know, he says, yeah, the first butcher said to us, no, I'm not going to cut up your pigs. What do you mean? <laughs> but I'll give you money and then you'll cut them for me, right? No. For, and I found out it's because what my later butcher calls a box cutter. The guy doesn't actually break down whole carcasses, so he doesn't know how to break down my carcasses. So that was the first butcher problem. The second one was just too busy. He said, I'm really sorry, but I don't have time to cut up your pigs. Huh. We're going further afield. And the pigs are getting bigger. That's right. That is exactly right. And we were approaching Christmas. <laughs> Pork, ham, this is not good. So we finally find Sal in Balan, right at the, bon the point where we went, bugger this, we're going to become butchers. We're going to build a boning room because this is impossible. And what the Joe and I do when there's a problem is we solve it ourselves. We just take on more work and it's all done. And then we don't have to worry about other people. We just do stuff. So right when we decided, yep, we're going to do that, and we'd seen a guy in America had crowdfunded for a boning room and um, abattoir in Vermont. And he'd done that as, on a crowdfunding platform. I think it was Kickstarter he did it on. We'd seen that, and we knew about crowdfunding, obviously. And we knew that the arts community uses crowdfunding a lot. Um, 
But nobody in Australia was crowdfunding for agriculture. Like, that's a pretty strange idea, right? Or it was then. Um, so we thought, OK, we'll crowdfund. The rewards will be pork. And we'll build a boning room. How hard can this be? <laughs> it's really good that I'm, I actually was thinking about today on the way here, I have rose-tinted glasses. Like, I literally have rose-tinted glasses. And that is kind of how I see the world all the time. So how hard could this be? So we put up our crowdfunding campaign. We were aiming for $21,500 to build a boning room on the farm. Sal, at that stage, was doing our butchering and knew we had plans to build a boning room. And I had just said, hey, Sal, do you reckon I could come and start cutting up pigs with you? He's like, sure, sure, Tim, whatever. Yeah, fine. So I turn up that first night with my knife. And he goes, you're actually going to cut with me? <laughs> yes, I actually want to learn to butcher these pigs. All right. And he let me in the back. And I spent the next six months cutting up our pigs with him to learn how to butcher. Um, Back to the crowdfunding, we, we went for $21,500. On day 19 of the campaign, we hit our target. Like, it was, it was more than $1,000 a day that people were just going, yes, we want this. Because we all know that the culture and the climate have changed. People do want this. They want to know where their food's coming from, and they want to be part of the story. And that's the story of our success, that, this, that the tide is changing, that people care about this stuff. So ultimately, we raised $27,500. Stuart got busy building the burning room from a converted refrigerated shipping container, a 40-foot high-top refrigerated container. I, I have people say to me, I need a Stuart. <laughs> and I'm just going to say to you, Joel said this to um, Joel Salatin when he was at our place recently, said, you all need a Stuart. <laughs> and you need a Tammy. So the point being, you kind of need a team. You need a team of people who are prepared to work really hard and preferably have diverse skill sets. It's helpful. So, <laughs> so he built me my burning room, and on the 21st of January last year, I took over doing all of the butchery for all of our pork and beef, which I didn't actually train on. So I taught myself with YouTube. <laughs> it's amazing what you can learn on the internet. Uh, I'm very, very slow at beef, but my cuts are beautiful. They just take me a really long time to cut. So we're a butcher, an experienced butcher will break down a, a beef carcass in about two and a half hours. It takes me about six to do a side. Like, I'm pretty slow. I'm comfortable with that. It's OK. I think of it as mindfulness. <laughs> um, so the critical part of that story with where we took over the butchery is that we went from December of that year before running a small loss to January, we turned our first profit. We went from 40% of our profit going to butchering to 11% going to butchering. And we've not looked back. We've not run a loss since we opened the burning room. So encouraged by all of this, and because what else is pork good for, of course, but curing. And we really like, you know, salami and hamon and Coca-Cola, and they're beautiful products. So we thought, let's build a curing room, a commercial kitchen, because we've been making all these things in our shed, and that's illegal. Um, so let's make it for sale. So we went back and we crowdfunded again, and the second time we raised $35,000. And right now, the kitchen and curing room is ready, except for the plumber it keeps cancelling, and I need him to plumb in my stove so the inspectors can come and inspect it. So that's the holdup. Ben, ben came through three times and saw it in the last week, like sitting there, ready, uninspected. So. Yeah, Ben has a plumber for me. <laughs> We've had this conversation. So, so now, obviously, in terms of people talk about value add, obviously, it allows us to value add further on the product. One thing I would say with meat, quite unlike turning berries into jam, is that example earlier, berries into jam really does change the price point enormously. Curing a hamon, because of the amount of uh, weight loss, the time, you know, the opportunity cost of hanging it for a year, the energy requirements. Of course, we're going to charge more, but that's actually to account for how much is lost in the process of making it. So the value adding to meat is not the clear kind of profit game. And that's not why we do it, frankly. It's because we want to be able to turn it into everything it can possibly be. So bone stocks, that probably is a, more, a clearer profit, because I'll be doing bone stocks as soon as I have the room licensed. And the reason I'm doing that, though, is because we're turning it into a no-waste facility. It means all the heads will be pate de tete and porchetta de testa, or the bones will be bone stocks. The, f the fat will be rendered for lard, but it won't be rendered for lard because I would have to go under another standard and do batch clostridium testing if I render lard. 
So you hear it from me first, I'm going to be melting fat. right because that's totally different um, the yeah so we we'll be making a lot of products that just mean that we don't have to waste anything from the farm nothing will be we used to bury well we still are burying some bones we give a lot away to customers for dogs and stock bones and things but we just have too much so now we won't ever have to do that and by the time anything does go out on our garden it will have been turned like into the bone stocks the bones will then be burnt and will then be mulched and will then be biochar on our garden so everything will be as kind of bioavailable as possible before it hits the dirt. And none of it will actually leave the farm. And that's wildly exciting. Um, to the sales model, when we first started, okay, we'd sold pork before we had pigs. That's unusual. Um, we had people following the story up. I'd been writing a food blog because of my PhD work on food stuff. So people were pretty excited about these crazy city people going to the country and they'd followed that story and seriously had put in orders before we had the pork. So that's unusual. I don't think most people are going to have the ready market already. But what I would say about that story is start telling the journey now and telling it publicly. Start building the community that are following the story as early as you can. Whether you're better at doing that with pictures, maybe it's just an Instagram account for you. Maybe it's a blog if you're a writer. Maybe it's you know going to the farmer's markets and getting to know lots of people and sharing your story. But start telling the story earlier, because that's how you're going to be connected to people earlier. Um, our first sales were by Twitter. <laughs> I have pork. <laughs> and they were, we'll have some. <laughs> DM me your address. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> if somebody tries to order pork on Twitter now, I nearly die. Um, I much prefer the Open Food Network shop for my <laughs> orders these days. Um, but I did. I took email orders, actually, for pff, over a year. That is a management nightmare. I do not recommend that beyond, you know, sort of a pig's worth of meat. It's not, it's not a viable option. But then I got involved with Kirsten and Serenity, and they helped me. They actually helped me make the shop happen because I, they were going, it's ready, Tammy, whenever you want to populate it. And I'm like, I know. I just, yeah, I found it hard to find time, and they really, really helped me get it in there. And, and I didn't actually realize with the Open Food Network, I have to admit, because we were already accustomed to selling out of our meat most fortnights, I didn't really appreciate that when I got onto OFN, I was going to find another market, that there were going to be more people there who didn't already know about us. And the very first order cycle I was on OFN, I got like eight new customers. I went, oh yeah, <laughs> it's like another place to have a, a profile, that's amazing. So that was actually really nice to see that 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 the OFN is attracting people who are looking for people like us, and it's working. Um, and I was going to actually, the question about differentiation, I was going to say, from my perspective, if we all just remained small and didn't try to grow enough for everyone, then it doesn't matter. We don't have to differentiate. You just, you're the local person that they buy from. And I'm not going to grow any more porks. There's plenty of room for more pig growers around us. Um, we have a, we call it an ethically viable no growth model. We, we knew what we wanted, what size we wanted to be. We're tiny. We have a herd of about 110 pigs and about 12 to 18 cattle at any time. We process 16 pigs in one steer a month and we run a lot of workshops and that's it. And we won't grow. So there's room for other growers to then do that. And I don't think we really need to differentiate, frankly. I mean, we differentiate from cheap food, obviously. We differentiate on ethics of how animals are raised. But for the other small growers, we share the love as much as possible. If I can't supply you, I give you a list of three other producers who can. Um, the other part of our model is the CSA. We run a community-supported agriculture membership, which I don't know any other meat growers who are running a CSA model. I've been trying to think if there are any, but I don't, I don't know of any. We have 50 members. One here. Um, we started, like as soon as I announced, I think immediately I had 18 or 20. So immediately we knew that was a viable thing to pursue. And it's just grown and grown. I'm out of beef shares for the city. I can't supply any more to them. Um, the region, I still have room for a few more beef shares, but hardly any. And that means I'm working towards the CSA to reduce my admin load so that I don't even have to take ad hoc orders, basically. I'm working towards, I want 80% CSA and leave 20% for farm gate and local restaurants for occasional special events. That's my goal. We're not there yet, but we're certainly well on the way. Um, we, on the restaurant question, 
we basically don't sell to restaurants unless I decide I want to work with them, and I'm pretty fussy. They, they have to not just want bellies, you know, chefs. Anybody here a chef? Good, because like, my God, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, most of them are not that great to work with because they want just your primes or, or they want you to do all this work boning out a shoulder, but they want, you to, they want to pay the price as though you've sold them the whole shoulder and not boned it out. And that's not a great relationship for us at all. I don't run a wholesale list. I, I do it on, based on labor inputs. I'm basically kind of a Marxist pricer. So if you buy a whole shoulder that I don't have to bone out, that's 20 bucks a kilo. If I've boned out that, what Australians would call the neck or what we call the copa, if I've boned that out, that's $30 a kilo because there's a lot of work in getting that down to that size and it's a smaller amount being sold at once. So it's similar to a wholesale price, price but I explain the model and why you're going to pay more for a certain amount. Side of a pig's going to be $16 a kilo, so it's half the price of that same piece of meat you would have got, but I did more work to get it to you. And I have more admin if I'm selling, obviously, to more people. So yeah, we don't sell to many restaurants. We have one beautiful one in Malmesbury, small holdings. I can't give them enough props. Dan texts me and says, Da, what do you got today? And I say, too much topside in the freezer, and I'll save you a pork shoulder if you want. He says, done. And he writes his menu to what I've said I can give him. That's a good relationship with a chef. The others, I just say no. And Melbourne, I say no, because it's, um, it's, you know, we only come once a month, and I'm not coming more. So I'm not going to sell to any chefs in Melbourne which leaves more room for the bigger growers who want to, so I just send them to them. It's like this wonderful kind of um, food economy where we can share the love again, and everyone can still access ethically raised pork. I think that's our whole model, pretty much. Oh, labor. I've been trying to talk about labor on the farm. So we, last year, we had woofers throughout the year, and that was actually great. We had a really positive experience. Not everybody does. You hear bad stories about bad woofers. I hear bad stories about bad woofing hosts. Um, so I think it's kind of a problem on both sides. We were really lucky. Out of 12, we had one dud. And he was a really nice dud. <laughs> just, just wasn't very helpful. Um, yeah, life skills, low. Um, we this year changed though, because woofers, I mean a lot of them were backpackers or people seeking their second year visa. And so while they got very enthusiastic when they were at the farm, their goal wasn't to be farmers or to be engaged in this particular, in food systems. Yep. Oh, sorry, I should have said that. Willing Workers on Organic Farms. It's an international network that connects farmers with those who would like to work on farms in exchange um, for a room and board. And it's a great system. Um, but we decided we wanted to work with people who we could actually support into their own viable enterprise. So we now have, can't call them interns, Fair Work Act says if you want to call them an intern, you have to pay them the award wage, and then you would have to charge them rent and board, uh, rent and, board and tuition, and the taxman gets his dollar. And people obviously are then protected from exploitation, which is the purpose of that act. We instead have volunteer residents. And it's advertised as a voluntary residency, and that's great. And we take them out to nice dinners in the region and things as a form of thanking them and that's legal. If I gave them any money, it's actually, it goes back into the intern space and it would be illegal. So that's kind of a... <laughs> What's the minimum period when you take a volunteer? We're doing three months. Yeah, so the idea is to do four three-month internships a year. Um, it means we're contributing to the next generation of farmers, but also we're having a consistent labor supply on the farm. And they work across the whole system so they work out with the pigs, fencing, all of that. In the boning room with me, they learn the entire craft of butchery. They also sit down with me and I teach them our accounting system, in, uh, the way we invoice, the way we deal with my complicated spreadsheeting system, because it is still complicated because I run the CSA and the OFN and they, they don't talk to each other really unless I make them. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that tonight too. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so they learn every single thing about the system. The business model, how we arrived at the decision to have 12 sows watching the land and watching our finances. Um, how we keep our costs down. Stuart makes his own fuel for the farm ute. I won't let him put it in my ute. Um, we, yeah, so they learn everything, and that works really well. And then we do have two apprentices as well. We have a part-time school-based apprentice on the farm with Stuart. He's there two and a half days a week. And I have a part-time butcher's apprentice, my head meat girl, Jess, and she's with me 
three days a fortnight. So, because it's a fortnightly schedule. Yes, so that's the total labor on the farm. There's no, and we have volunteers in the boning room, as Ben always gets really jealous and says that I'm being super sexist, because we have Meet Girls Mondays. <laughs> 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 it is great. We love our Meet Girls Mondays. It's really nice working in, a, in there with a bunch of women who are trying to learn this craft and who found a female butcher to teach them. Um, I think it's opened a space for women to work, in, work with meat, and it's really, really... I, I love that side of what I do. Um, so we do have a kind of rotation of volunteers, although I'm... To be honest, I have too many volunteers now. So I'm actually about to put them into... We run our workshops, butchery, curing, sausage making, sal salami days and producers days. And I'm actually going to create a, like an intermediate workshop for all the ones who want to come and volunteer so they can learn, so that I can manage them in one day of skill sharing a month or something. Um, because I just can't, I can't, it's not a very big boning room, it's a container. So I can't have more than four of us in there at a time. Yeah, so that's, that's the answer, the labor question, because that labor is definitely always one of the biggest issues for small farms like ours. I mean, all of us face, this is, as Joel was saying, you know, it comes from Wendell Berry, but more eyes per acre is how you do kind of agroecological farming. You need more people looking at the land, not less. Not the old model like Kirsten's stats about people leaving the land, more food being produced on that same land, but with more people. We're the opposite. Agroecology is labor and knowledge intensive, and we just have to find models to do that and to value that labor and that knowledge. We certainly value knowledge and labor over efficiency. We're not big fans of um, the productivist mindset that leads us to more and more efficient modes of production, which leads us to pigs and sheds. And I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tammy. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions for Tammy. Have you got any questions from the floor? Oh, Yep, so there are different levels of licenses for um, meat processing. We have a retail butcher shop license, which actually the level of testing for that is, actually, is pretty low. Uh, there's an annual cleaning verification test. Um, recently our floor was accidentally s tested because <laughs> Stuart dropped the swab. And the floor was uh, four times under the limit of what we could have had on the bench. So <laughs> that's pleasing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But, but if we wanted to cryovac our ready-to-eat foods, so we vac pack all our fresh cuts, um, if we wanted to do that with the ready-to-eat stuff, which is the ham, the bacon, the smoke tox, the pastrami, we would have to run a listeria management plan. And PrimeSafe have just made those rules more onerous, the testing requirements. We now, if we wanted to, we don't cryovac those things. If we wanted to, we would have to um, not only do quarterly Actually, there's an initial intensive period, but ultimately it's quarterly environmental testing and every batch testing. And from the batches, it's five samples of every product in the form that it will be sold. So if I do whole hams, I have to sacrifice five whole hams and they test it and throw it away. So you can imagine from the ethics of where we're coming from, aside from the cost, that's so awful, we would never do it. Um, if you want to sell it, yeah, I, could, I can glad wrap it, but I can't vac pack it. So, bacon, by the way, has an exemption, because culturally, we all cook bacon, don't we? What if you don't? Shit. <laughs> You're all going to die, apparently, if you don't. <laughs> so, so you, you can cryovac bacon, but you can't anything else unless you have a listeria management plan, and by my quick figures, in lost product and the testing costs, I'd be up for about six or $7,000 a year. Not, not to mention how much meat we would have wasted from animals that were grown solely for that purpose. And it's just so disrespectful, I cannot even fathom it, which is why we're working on a legal defense fund to do legal reform advocacy, because that's outrageous. Um, in terms of the other testing in the curing room, whole new world of hell that we're just entering. Salamis are a fermented product. They're called uncommonuted fermented meat. I'm still not really sure what uncommonuted means. <laughs> I think it just means broken. Um, and for that, we have, to do, we have to do pH testing, water activity testing, and then we have to do batch testing. 
but it's not um, sacrificial product as long as we're not cryovacking it. We can give them just a sample of the um, product, but every batch. So that's a new level of testing that we're entering, and it's worse. You can't be regulated by both your council and PrimeSafe. It's kind of a no double jeopardy thing, which is good in theory, problematic in practice, because if I want to make my bone stocks or if I wanted to make a potato pie, they're going to make me make it as though it has meat in it. So I have to do temp checks all the way. I have to cook it above 65 for at least 10 minutes. I mean, it's like, and then I can't cryovac it unless I listeria test. So a mixed blessing on whether or not you can be regulated by them. But yes, it, it is. Oh, and there's a new one too, dry aging beef. We dry age our beef. We do four and six week dry aged sides. And the new rules would mean that I would have to hang those carcasses in their own separate chamber at the same temperature as my chiller. So zero to one degrees. But a separate chamber, I would have to do, I would have to have a velocimeter. So it's not a dinosaur, I've looked it up. Um, which would test that the wind airflow is 0.2 to 0.6 meters per second. Uh, six, 75 to 85% humidity. And weekly thermidium and E. coli testing. Because you're all familiar with everybody, the epidemic of people dying from dry aged beef, right? So we fed some ministers some dry-aged beef actually last Monday and gave them a bottle of blue condemnation ink and told them they better pour it on because it's now illegal. That was awkward, <laughs> but, <laughs> but great. Um, yeah, so we're working on those things. Some of it's ridiculous. I'm all for food safety, but some of this stuff is ridiculous. Well, and you know, once you get out of the mindset, everybody cryovax everything nowadays. Like that's how we, especially because if we're transporting it like to Melbourne in, in our eskies and things, or not, es uh, cooler. Um, but... Actually, you don't have to. If you run your production model tight so that you're always producing to order, you don't need to cryovac every single thing. It does increase the shelf life, but if you just go, okay, we're not increasing the shelf life. And so that's how we're running it. We're not even gonna glad wrap our um, salamis. They're just gonna have that lovely white mold and they're just gonna be just like you're in France. I'd bring them in a basket, but the regulator won't let me. <laughs> so they'll be in a sterile plastic tub. <laughs>